fellow Agilists. Today I have with me Tobias Mayer, author of the book People's Scrum and Wanderer Wanderer, which I think is a great description for your, for your LinkedIn profile there. How are you, Tobias? I'm all right, Chris. Yeah, it's good to be here. And yeah. uh, it's good to talk with you finally after lots of interaction on LinkedIn. Yeah, so interestingly, this is how Tobias and I, I met. We were interacting a lot on LinkedIn, various debates on various topics. So I was actually introduced to Tobias by an old colleague of mine, uh, Karine Margol, who mentioned you as uh, someone someone to look out for, I guess. And and then I, I came across you in a number of debates on, on LinkedIn, and I thought, wow, this person disagrees with me, and that's a fantastic thing. I always welcome disagreement. I welcome debate. And that prompted me to want to, to speak with you. I love, I love a situation where my perceptions are being challenged, where I'm not just in an echo chamber. And that was why I actively sought to have you as a guest. So, yeah, thank you for agreeing to speak with me today. Yeah, you know, it's interesting, Chris, isn't it? This, this um, agreement, disagreement on, on LinkedIn, because what I've found over the years is that the people that I um, disagree with in a thoughtful way tend to be the people I have the best conversations with. And like you said, it's not always about um, finding agreement between things. Sometimes we find alignment and sometimes we learn new ways of looking at things, new, new angles to stuff. Um, and that's... a to you and to me, I think both of us, it's much more interesting than just sort of finding people to agree with our perspective. Because we do find that, right? We can find that. And then we find the people that just violently disagree and want to just sort of shout and argue with you. And that's mm. also, well, that's even less interesting, actually, of course. But, but the, you know, what I've enjoyed about our interactions is we, we do see things differently. And it looks like um, quite distinct disagreement sometimes, but actually it isn't. It, it's just different ways of looking at things you're looking at you're looking at it from this point and i'm looking at it from that point and yeah it's uh, it becomes entertaining it becomes a learning journey part of the learning journey absolutely and this this for me i think i what i what i like about this is i enjoy that experience when it's a healthy conflict when it's a, a disagreement you know, and, and that word can have negative connotations when you have a disagreement between two two individuals and they both share their viewpoints and it's not about trying to get you to agree with mine or vice versa. It's just the fact that we can share openly our disagreement in a healthy and constructive way that isn't about dismissing the other person's viewpoint. What I liked about our, our, our interactions is it was very respectful. It was just kind of like, well, I, I can see where you're coming from there. It wasn't combative. It wasn't, it wasn't adversarial in any way. It was just two people discussing alternative viewpoints. And, and I, I always welcome that. That neurodiversity is something I always try and foster with the teams that I, that I coach and that I work with. I want people to challenge one another for the pursuit of improvement. Exactly. Yeah. You know what happens with um, the online stuff, of course, is is to, is to shouting out of the car window syndrome, isn't it? You can be as abusive as you want, and no one can, you know, because you're in a different car, they, people can't really do anything to you. So we get a lot of that playing out on on the different forums here. And I, and I think that over the, over the years, people have started to kind of wise up to it a bit more. And, and I have noticed in the last few years, actually, a lot more respectful dialogue going on in some of the forums and all of them. But, you know, LinkedIn uh, perhaps lends itself a bit more to that because we're all trying to show up as, show up as professionals. That's a great <laughs> ringtone. That, that ringtone, yeah. That's, uh, that reminds me to feed the children, but of course they're probably not little kids. They're probably little children in school. Nice. So okay. Maybe, so one of the topics I was keen to talk to you about, and again, it's, it's something that you and I have debated a little bit on LinkedIn, was, was agile agnosticism. What are, your, what are your thoughts on the whole agile agnosticism movement, so to speak? I don't really understand it, to be honest, Chris. I mean, I yeah. think that um, when, when people talk about agnostic, I think what they mean is they're not tied into Scrum or they're not tied into extreme programming or not tied into um, anything else. But I think that's all of us, actually. I don't think any of us are really, truly. I mean, perhaps if you're Ken Schwaber and Jeff Sutherland, you're pretty tied into Scrum. Uh -huh. you're, right? So you're going to be. Um, um, but I even think, you know, people like Ken Beck who, and Ron Jeffries, who started the whole XP thing, um, they've moved on, right? So <laughs> we move on and we discover better ways of doing things and helping other people to do them, whatever that line is. I should know it off by heart, of course. Um, but, you know, so when we say we're agnostic, it's, it's an odd term. It's an odd term to use, actually. Um, 
I don't I don't know that any I don't really know anyone who isn't. Sure. Are we using it? Do we do we mean indifferent when we say agnostic, or do we mean just um, not bound by a? You know, the, the term agnostic in, in religion has a particular meaning. Are we using it in that way, or I don't really know. I guess it's an interesting point. How you interpret that that word in itself? I I think what you were touching upon there with regards to not being, I guess, heavily dogmatic about a certain way of doing things. That's that's the interpretation that I, I take from it. Agile agnosticism to, to, to me means when I'm working with a, a client, a company, and trying to help them improve, I'm not coming in with any predetermined, you're going to work with SAFE or Scrum or otherwise. It's that what I want to help you guys do is, is find what works for you. And that, and that to me is a series of experiments to, to discover what works for your situation, for, for your people always in the interest of continuous improvement. You might start with Scrum, you might find actually we're going to blend in a little bit from, from safe and blend in a little bit from that because I know some people see safe as a bit of a dirty word sometimes. There's a bit of a stigma about it. But for me, it's about helping the company find what works for them. And that makes me agnostic. I don't have any predetermined approach in mind. Uh, and I, I know you mentioned you feel we all are, but I, 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 I have certainly seen in my experience hasn't always been the case there is that dogmatism about you must do scrum and you must do this and if you don't you're not doing this you're not doing scrum or you're not agile you're not agile enough you know these sorts of phrases come out there um well I guess that... there is some truth in there is some truth in the if you're not doing this you're not doing scrum uh, because the scrum has a guide hmm. that lays out the rules of scrum if you like um I, i've heard people describe scrum as a game and the game has rules hmm. so uh, you might have a chessboard and you might have all your chess pieces and you might um, play a game where you're just moving pieces across a board. Um, but if you're not following the actual rules of chess, you're not playing chess, you're playing something else, a different game. Um, so if you decide that your bishop can move in straight lines um, or it can jump over pieces like in a, in a game of drafts or something, then you've made up a, a cool game perhaps, but it isn't chess. And it's a bit like that with Scrum. You can't just say, well, we're doing Scrum, but we're not doing Know, we're not going to bother with retrospectives because they're a waste of time um, or we don't need a scrum master or, then you're not they might be great you might be doing something wonderful but you're not doing scrum and so why call it scrum that that's my that's my sort of beef with it really it's like if you're doing uh, bits and pieces of extreme programming you're not doing extreme programming you're, you're doing you're doing, you might be doing pairing it's great you're doing some pair pairing. If you're not doing extreme programming you just drop the other practices that they have and so it's just like using the names in a respectful way by um, the, the names that the people came up with who kind of invented these ways of working. Mm. But, and the thing about Scrum, so I, I guess in some ways I'm, by your definition of agnostic, I'm not agnostic actually, um, because I do think that um, when you strip away the terminology around the, from the Scrum Guide and you look at the abstractions in there, it is what we do anyway. Right. And so when we're doing creative work, we do what they are describing there as Scrum with a bunch of you know, terms put on top of it. Um, we talk about what we're going to do before we do it. We do it and we check along the way what we're doing to make sure we're doing the right thing. And at the end, we just kind of think about how did that go? Uh, and we say, well, it went quite well, let's do it again. So we're doing all of those things. We're planning, we're, we're working, we're doing daily reflection periodic reflection and then we're looking at the end of some piece of work whatever that piece of work is how does that go so when we're making things and we don't quite know what the outcome is going to be we sort of have to use the same process that they describe in scrum we have to use that structure you know we've got to think about what we're going to do we're going to do it and then we're going to reflect on what we did that's all that scrum is and so it's almost like how do you not do it if you're doing creative work when people say we don't really need to do scrum i kind of think doing it you're just using different words for it but that's so you know so dropping things like let's not bother with planning planning is a waste of time we just got to get on with the work sure but you're not going to what kind of work are you going to do you don't know because you haven't thought about it so that's what i see that's how i see scrum i see it in this very, very high abstract way yeah, that we something we do it's interesting what you, what you, you mentioned there um I was speaking with Mike Cohen last week and he mentioned how he wanted the word agile to go away. Not because he doesn't believe in it, but because he doesn't want people to be thinking about 
agile all the time. It's just, it's just what we do. It's how it's just how we work. And when you were saying there about some of the things that underpin Scrum, it's just how we work as knowledge workers. It makes complete sense. You know, planning important for a reason. Um, and one of the things I often encounter or have seen with people that are reluctant to commit to a certain ceremony or one of the things that do underpin the likes of Scrum and, and Agile, like, like planning, like retrospectives, is just to ask them, are you, are you happy with how things currently are? And mm. if they can answer no, they're not, what well, odds are they need to change a variable? Because if you keep doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results, you're just you can be frustrated in a few weeks' time anyway. That's the definition of insanity, as, as per Einstein. So you need to change something, see how it goes, demonstrate a bit of an empiricism, reflect again, and see how, how things are progressing. Is it, is it moving in the right direction? Exactly. You know, and the thing about, we, we use terms like sprint in Scrum and things, oh, well, we're doing, we're not, we don't want to do sprints. For me, it's kind of like saying, we're going to do science, but we're not going to do experiments. A sprint is an experiment. It's a test to see, can, is this thing going to work? And at the end of it, we assess whether the, the experiment was useful and took us to a, a new place or it didn't. If it didn't, we go back and try something else. So you can't really do science unless you're doing experiments. You can't really do creative work unless you're um, working in blocks of time that allow you to do feedback. That's it's interesting. It's interesting you say that because I, I have never heard anyone else describe a sprint as an experiment. But I completely agree that that's to me what it is. I don't. I don't hear enough people talking about it in that lens. Often, it's a it's a time block. It's you've got a goal in mind. You're focused on something, and and yeah, it's probably a lot of a lot of time. It's just right. We're going to squeeze in as much as we can in this time frame because that's the way people think it needs to be. But describing it up front as an experiment, it's an opportunity to see what we can learn in this next few weeks, and then pivot accordingly based on what we learn in the next two weeks. Is the number in my mind uh, for, for a, 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 a sprint, a, a typical yeah. one, but whatever that time box ends up being, whatever that iteration ends up being, the following one, you've learned something new and you're adjusting your trajectory accordingly based on what you've learned. That's to me is, is, the, is the beauty in it. Now, the, the challenge I think I have around sprints sometimes is it can, uh, it can reinforce a connotation to a certain pace. A sprint is a a rapid rush towards a finish line or it's 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 something high energy and things like that and and i can reinforce the let's fit as much as we can into that time frame rather than it being about a sustainable pace so actually personally i i don't tend to refer to them as sprints anymore i tend to say time box or iteration just just for that because I, I want to because i want to really reinforce with with people and, and, and companies need to find sustainable pace it's not about burning people out into the you know running them into the ground in, in as much as they can in that time time box it's about finding what works for what pace works for them yeah i think it's, you know some of the terminology we use is unfortunate and we, we get kind of stuck with it don't we but um i don't like the word sprint either because it does it does bring up this this idea of you're always rushing towards something and you're going fast that's what a sprint is you, you when you're running you don't sprint the whole mm distance run you don't sprint the whole run do you, you sprint in certain periods um so you know the term iteration is useful the time box might be useful um i like i like that what i like about sprints and time boxes is the rhythm is it's rhythmical yes um, can we create we live in rhythms we live in the rhythms of the seasons and the days and the, the you know the, the, the light and dark and everything our bodies circadian rhythm you know exactly yeah and so um we are we are creatures of rhythm and so having rhythm in the workplace makes complete sense to me when people say well can we do we're doing two week sprints but can we add a few days to the end of this sprint i, I say well it's kind of like can you add you know an extra uh, an extra sunday on the end of the week the question i is wish a, <laughs> i wish it's a ludicrous question isn't it so, um you can do whatever you like in the workplace you can but then why call it a sprint and why say you're doing scrum if you're just going to like have these periods of time of different lengths that might work really well for you um I, I wouldn't do it personally i like rhythm i like i like to be able to sort of predict when i'm going to review a piece of work with someone i like to be able to give them a date and say on tuesday next week we're going to review the work not to get right to them on monday night and say we can't do it till thursday sorry because they might not be able to come then no one's reviewing my work i'd like them to review what i have done on the tuesday 
even if I have to do this, that is much more useful to me than trying to get perfect and keep putting it off and putting it off. And so Scrum just kind of like builds all that into its framework, essentially. And just reminds us of the usefulness of this way of working, which is something we actually already do. I don't know if the Scrum inventors acknowledge that. I think what they've done is they've taken a natural way of doing creative work and just um, put some formality around it. I'm sure. Cynically, I might say they packaged it, but they did more than that because they've actually formal, they've given it some formality. And I think in the workplace, we need that formality. Yeah, we are, we are humans, as humans, we are creatures of comfort. We seek that equilibrium that when we're cold, we, we put on something warm. When we're hungry, we mm. eat. Yeah, we, we seek that comfort and having a cadence, a heartbeat, a rhythm, which, which Scrum and, and many agile ways of working provides, I, I find highly useful and works very well. That's why I tend to reinforce. Yeah, it's just the word comfort. Uh, I, I think it might be comfort, but it's also, there's something about safety in that, mm -hmm. isn't there? We, we, we throw out the term psychological safety a lot in the workplace these days. There's a safety to knowing when things are going to happen. There's a predictability about it. We know where we stand. And I think that's really important. It's important for um, a sense of security. You know, if we never quite know what's going to happen at work, we get very, un very nervous and uncomfortable, and our work is then affected by that. Absolutely. You know, trying to meet, meet the date, and suddenly the date changes. It's like you move, you're playing football, and someone's moving the goalposts. <laughs> Not helpful. Not at all. The other thing, the other thing that I want to just mention is that you know, extreme programming. People say, should we do extreme programming or Scrum? It's, it's like they're not incompatible. Um, Scrum has nothing, says nothing at all about development practice. It's absolutely silent. It's agnostic, if you like, Chris. It's agnostic mm. about development practices. Um, but anyone who wants to improve the way they develop software would be foolish not to look into the practices that make up XP. Um, because we, they are known to be good. Um, they are years of uh, of people developing software have converged towards what has become yeah. extreme programming. And again, the word something now gets dropped a lot more than Scrum gets dropped, um, but the practices remain. And people who develop software well are doing all, if not most of the practices, most if not all of the practices of XP, because it, they make sense. It's a, it's a really valid point, isn't it, that, that you can combine different ways of working, different or leverage different schools of thinking. And as you say, Scrum and XP can go hand in hand, but I think sometimes there is there is a reluctance to, because there is, a, I guess, a, that lack of understanding. It can also or, or sometimes seem like, oh, we're doing Scrum, or we're doing this, or we're doing that. But not often enough is it, well, we're doing this, and we're, we're leveraging this practice as well, because that, that works for us. And this, is this I guess, this stems back to my, my view of agnosticism. I would help a company experiment with lots of different things until they find what works for them. And that, and that could be lever leveraging practices from many different ways of working out there, including Scrum, XP, and otherwise. So I'm keen to talk about with you about the, the, the updates to the Scrum guides and the, the Scrum values in particular. Is there any, any particular updates to that, that guide that came out that, that resonated with you and that you felt was particularly needed? I think simplifying the Scrum team helped a lot because there was a lot of confusion about the development team and the Scrum team um, and who was in the Scrum team and who wasn't. So they simplified it that way. So now there's just the Scrum team and it has developers, product owner, and Scrum master team, the Scrum team. So everything is the Scrum team. It's not the development team do this and someone else does that. So I like that aspect of it. What I don't like about the change is that the word accountability the word role has been dropped. I'm, I don't really care. I'm agnostic on that one. Um, <laughs> but the word accountability has come in, and I'm not agnostic on that. I really intensely dislike that term. I, I think the, using the word accountability um, for Scrum is throwback to old ways of thinking and working. What we need is not accountability. What we need is responsibility. Um, Hassi Solberg, who is uh, an educator uh, from Finland, has a great education system, by the way. But uh, how does he say, how does he phrase it? He said that accountability is what's left when you take away responsibility. 
So we don't show up to work in a responsible enough way. Therefore, we have to we have to put accountability, we just sort of paste it on top. So accountability means we're accountable to someone else. Responsibility means we're responsible for an outcome. So they are they have very different essences to them. And so when you, we talk about accountability of the product owner now and accountability of the scrum master, like the scrum master is accountable for the success of the sprint or something. Uh, then, then there's a whole bunch of people who are no longer accountable because someone else is taking that accountability on. So I think it does more damage than, than uh, and that change does more damage than good. It's interesting that I'm, I'm a big believer. Um, you tend to David Marquet recently that leadership is language. I'm a huge believer in language being very, very important. And you've just highlighted there one example of a, a slight language change can have very different implications. Uh, another one I, I remember seeing in, the, in the, the revision to the Scrum Guide was the removal of self-organizing and change to self-managing teams. What were your thoughts with that change? Yeah. Uh, I, again, it's not something I embrace. Um, I can kind of say, well, it's all kind of one and the same thing, really, self-managing, self-organizing. I preferred I preferred the term self organizing um, because I find it more encompassing. I suppose it's just sort of it's a bigger bigger term, responsible for all of the parts of it. Um, managing I don't I'm not a big fan of the term managing just in general. No, me either. Uh, I, I I think it's just it's not a bad word in and of itself, but it's got such a negative connotation these days in organizational structures, isn't it? You know, when we talk about managers that you know it's we there's also sort of a movement to get rid of managers because and it's not because managing is a bad thing obviously it's not we want to manage things don't we but it's the way it's been done that's yeah. got got such a bad rap it's the micromanagement it's the sort of command comply ways of of working that have put everyone off managers so to bring that term back without really having a chance to rethink it is only going to just kind of like make it a bit more negative i think yeah there's another one that's um links quite closely to that there's, there's been a rise of the role of delivery manager and my my concern about that role is that it suggests for me that delivery becomes the responsibility of that of that manager when actually what i'd rather be doing is enabling a team to be responsible for delivery themselves and I'd, I, my fear is it, it creates this bottleneck type of situation where a team will feel largely the delivery manager will resolve that part of it, rather than it being this collective shared responsibility. Yeah, it, again, it, I, I agree with you on that one for sure. I, you know, and uh, the thing about delivery manager, it's it's now um, conflated with scrum master in a lot of organisations. Yes, scrum master is, is the delivery manager or is the release manager. And you're right, it takes away the responsibility of doing that kind of work. The, the team should be doing that kind of work. Um, you know, I, the way I see the Scrum Master is, and I understand the difficulty that organizations have understanding the role because it doesn't fit in any known pigeonhole that they have. It doesn't fit into any HR box, essentially. Mm. Um, so that's why it gets renamed as all these other things, you know, slash project manager, slash release manager, slash delivery manager or whatever it is, you know, because um, people don't really get the role and the role is not a manager in, the, in any kind of sense, really. Um, in the original description to Scrum, they talked about the Scrum Master as managing the process, just holding the process. Really. Um, but the Scrum Master's job is to, is to um, create an environment where people can do their best work. Yeah. If no one's paying attention to the environment, the environment falls apart. If you, you know, you're not going to grow things in your garden if you don't care to take care of the soil. There's only so long it will, things will grow well. If you don't worry about the soil and you know dig it correctly and allow, allow it some fallow time and uh, um, add manure when you need to, you know, make sure it's got enough water and enough sun. If you don't do any of those things, your your plants are slowly going to deteriorate over over time. And we don't have anyone in our organisations who takes care of the environment in that way. We don't have a we don't have an organisational gardener, and I think that's really what the scrum master role ultimately is not managing people. Interesting, like the, the the rise of the 
head of remote and, and that sort of thing. Maybe we need the, I said the organizational gardener is there and we will. Yeah, I don't know how that works remotely, but I think it's the same kind of thing. It's, it's, it's about what is the environment we're working in. We don't, we often just don't pay enough attention to our environments. Um, an environment being physical environment, obviously, but also relationships. So relationships are part of our work environment, aren't they? How do I relate to people? Where's the toxicity? You know, the, the, the gardener is trying to like sense that and, and help help us to not remove it for us, but help us to work on improving the situations. Sure. So speaking of uh, speaking of people and toxicity, uh, one of my very topical things that I'm very keen to speak about at the moment is the, the concept of humans not being resources. I am I'm a huge advocate of this. And unfortunately, it's just it's one of those bits of business language that's just become so heavily ingrained that people use it without realizing they're using it and without realizing the, the impact it can have. So I'm, I'm, I'm keen on, on your thoughts. Should we change human resources to something else? And how, how would you combat or try and improve that situation? There are some organizations that have changed that term, but they, the things they've changed it to, I don't like much more either. When I worked at um, one company, they renamed it to Talent. Mm -hmm. Instead of human resource, you were you were talent, which I like even less. I think actually. I don't know why. It didn't it didn't quite seem to fit into. I don't know. It's just the it's a theater term, isn't it? Um, and, and it is it's it's depersonalizing as well. You know, out talent. I'm human. I'm person. So in some ways, I would almost prefer human resource. Uh, I think it, I think it's my friend um, Arbid Qureshi who who coins the term. We use the term resourceful human rather than human resource. And, and I like that. It's the same words, essentially, but just with a, with a different slant. Sure. I am resourceful and I'm, I am certainly human. And I like to be a resourceful human whenever I can. So in, in one sense, being a human resource isn't a bad thing. I like to be able to be a resource to someone. You know, I'm a resource to you in getting this podcast together. Without me, you wouldn't have this interview. Mm -hmm. so, I'm, so therefore, I'm a resource to you. If I wasn't here, you'd find someone else, obviously. But, um, but you know, so we can be, but it's become negative because we, we equate it with, um, we're using the term as a replaceable component, really, aren't we? That's what we're doing. We're I saying think this person is a resource, like, like this cog is a resource in the clock. Mm -hmm. You know, I take this cog out and put a new one in there. So we're using it in that way, and that's what it's—it's it's the use of it that's bad, not the words themselves. Yeah, and I think that—that's where, it, to me, the the damage stems from. Is it's when when it's used as a term because a, a resource is a, it's a pen, it's a chair, it's a piece of paper, it's a, a component, yeah. it's a, a cog in a machine. And when you describe a person as a resource, it can cause an abstraction an abstraction of them as not a person, but actually something numerical, a number, a line on a spreadsheet that it makes it easier to dispose of or treat them as, as less than human. And I think the yeah. challenge we have today in particular is we're in this virtual world. We don't have that face-to-face -face interaction we may not have had in the past. We may not have met a lot of the people we're working with. And sometimes you just someone's just an avatar behind the screen. And we've got to remember, actually, everyone's a beating heart behind their machine, their, their laptop. So the, the term resource, in that, when it's used in that context, obviously, it's the, it's the behavior that matters, not the word itself. If, if people are called human resources, but actually they're, they're, they're treated like a great group of humans, wonderful. But if, if it's the other way, then they're treated as resources. Yeah, we should be challenging the language, for sure. I mean, that, that and many other uses of language that we have, you know, challenging words like accountability, uh, challenging words like resource. Asking people, when you call me a resource, what can you tell me what you mean by that? That's all we need is just to, you know, ask questions around it, right? I'll tell you what the worst one is, though, than um, human resource for me is FTE. <laughs> and FTE, equivalent. Full -time equivalent, yeah. Full -time equivalent. Yeah, that's almost, that's definitely worse for me than a resource. There's something a little positive about a resource. Sure. Well, um, some, some alternatives I have heard uh, to human resources departments are 
uh, people operations, uh, employee experiences, I think was, was Airbnb. I quite liked the employee experiences one. To me, that, uh, that resonated quite well. There are alternatives out there. There are, there are a lot of companies that are changing that language. But to me, it, it absolutely comes down to begin, begin with empathy, right? Someone says resource, hey, what do you mean when you say that? Did you mean a pen, a piece of, a piece of paper, or, or, or resources as in, as in I need more CPU power or servers and things like that? Great, yeah, that's a resource. But did you mean people? Okay, I see. Mm. Yeah, just people. I mean, that, that might be simple in itself. HR uh, could also stand for human relationships if you wanted it to. You don't even have to change the, the, the name. Human relationships. But the problem is in a lot of these big organizations, the human resources is a, is a large blob of an organization, right? And it covers all kinds of things. It's not just about hiring. It's not just about resourcing. Um, one of the main functions of HR is essentially the police of the organization. I mean, let's be honest about this, right? And I don't, you know, it might upset some people to say that, but in a large organization, you need a group of people of a department to protect the company from rogue employees. Um, so the interests of the HR department is more towards the organization as a whole, the structure, rather than the individual person. So if you're, um, in conflict with the organization in some way, with your manager or with the structure, um, you're not going to be sided with by the HR department. You're just not, you know, you're, you're going to be the underdog in, in all of those situations. So are they really there for the individual employee or are they there for the system? Are they there for the system? So maybe we need two different, we need different departments. We need a department that's clearly aligned with the system and we need a department that's clearly aligned with the workers. And, you know, the Scrum Master role is the role in an organization that starts to move, shift us towards that way of thinking. It's like, I'm, I'm for the people. Mm. I'm not for the structure. I'm, I'm for challenging the structure. I'm for the people. And so maybe we need a department to build up around that. Possibly so. I'm, I'm very much in favor of looking after the people's needs. I've, I've been described as an agitator. And that's, I guess I, I, I liked that word. It was interesting. Um, but what he meant was that I, I challenge existing ways of doing things, the status quo, and always in the interest of improvement. So I, I'm not afraid to just step in and say, oh, well, could we try this differently? Or, or that doesn't seem to be working. And, and, and often it's database, right? So I, I will go out and capture the voice of the people. What, what do you want? Ask the team, ask the people, what are your thoughts about this? Okay, you're not quite happy here. Okay, what could we do differently? And I, I then champion change on their behalf. So I'm conscious of time, so uh, there's a couple of final things I wanted to, to ask you, and this is something I ask every guest who I have. I'm a big fan of retrospectives. You may have seen this. I create a new retrospective theme every week, right? And I've seen uh, them and I enjoy them. sorry, I said I've seen those and I enjoy them. You yeah, a whole bunch of them at Christmas time, didn't you? That I did indeed. Time. Yeah, I did a Ramadan one last week. Uh, there, there are all sorts of ones that I do. And Mike actually, my Cohen last week, challenged me to do a Taco Tuesday retrospective theme. So I'm, I'm keen to hear from you. If you could add any retrospect or themed retrospective to my backlog, what would it be? Oh, gosh, I wish I had some preparation time to think of this. <laughs> um, you've obviously covered all of the holidays, haven't you? You've got, you've kind of like... Uh, 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 I've covered a lot of the holidays. I've done, um, done a Diwali themed one. I'm trying to create more... Diversion, uh, diversity and inclusion themed retrospectives. A lot of them historically were very westernized. So I'm trying to add to that as well. Uh, someone mentioned today I should do a, a pride themed one, which I'm all on board with. That's, that's gone to the backlog. But yeah, is there anything that, that you would like to see? Is there anything like Yugi Kaltoga, for example? You know, you've just missed it, but on Saturday it was National Bat, International Bat Appreciation. <laughs> I think that would have made a really cool retrospective. Bat appreciation day. I'm, I'm really imagining yeah. Batman. I'm, I'm imagining... Uh, it was April the 17th this year. Okay. I think that would be a um, fascinating one to build a retrospective theme around. Bat appreciation day. It's it's obscure. It's, uh, it's a bit obscure. unorthodox, but I'm, I'm game. I'll add it. We'll go on back. Be clear, it's international. International battery. Worldwide. Worldwide. Right. 
I did not know there was a holiday for that. You've got a year to work on that. I've got a lot of time. I've got, I can, yeah, yeah. Lots, of, lots of time for my uh, creative juices to flow. Uh, the mm-hmm. other question I have for you is, you have lots of experience in, in agile coaching and scrum mastery and training people. If you had one, if you could distill one piece of advice to offer any aspiring agile coach, scrum master, agile professional, what would it be? Um, I would repeat what I've already said here, that the structure of Scrum is what we already do when we do creative work. If you can recognize that for yourself in your in the work that you do in your life, and when I say creative work, I'm talking about um, cooking dinner is a, crea- is a creative act. Doing the laundry is a creative act. You're, you're, you're making something better than it was. Right? So that's a creative act. We do, we do, the structure of Scrum appears, the structure of Scrum, the events of Scrum, the artifacts of Scrum appear in all of those situations. And I challenge people to look for them and find them because when you recognize that you're doing this anyway, it becomes less alien. Uh, it becomes not something to impose on people, but something to just say, well, why are we not doing this in the workplace? Why are we working in all these other weird ways in the workplace that we've learned about in school and MBA programs and who knows where? There's a natural creative way of working that um, most people do already. And it looks very, very much like Scrum without the labels. I think it's a, a great message. And actually, it's it's reinforced in a, a training technique I use, uh, the four C's. Uh, and I always use this when I'm, whenever I'm coaching concepts. And the first one of those is connection. So connect people to where they already are. Connect them to the subject matter in a way that makes sense and understands them. Go to where they are. And as you said, highlighting metaphorically some examples of where they're already doing this in creative works mm. can make it feel less less alien, less less it can cause less resistance, I feel. Excellent. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on my have an interview with you today. So thank you very much yeah. for your time. It's, it's been fun, Chris. Thanks a lot. Yeah, it's good to meet you. You too. Bless. Bye now. Bye then.